It's another cable show about God. Your host is Dr. Craig Johnson, pastor of Bethel Christian Fellowship in Agoura Hills and professor in residence at Chalcedon Christian Academy. Today we're going to talk about some good news, and here's the good news. It's not all about you. Recently I heard somebody say, here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is it's not all about you. The bad news is it's not all about you. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to bring some hope and encouragement to some hearts today because many of you that I'm speaking to today, it's no longer all about you. God has to position other people in your life. He is moving global chess pieces into place, and that has nothing to do with you. And did you know there are some times in life where it all depends on you? No, we always hear teaching about sowing and reaping and everything you do today is going to create a future tomorrow. But did you know there are some times in seasons in life where it's not about you. And that's not negative, that's good news. Some of you have been living your life and you've hit a certain crest of maturity and now you're just being watched by everybody else around you. All you got to do is walk it out because the Lord is doing many things. Good news, it's not all about you. Now look at our text today. It's very interesting in Luke 3, 1 and 2. How's this for a heart mover? Okay, let me read you some names. It was the 15th year in the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Herod ruled Galilee, and his brother Philip ruled Echuria and Traconitus. Licinius was the ruler of Abilene. It was at the time when Annas and Caiaphas were chief priests that God spoke to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. You're reading that and you go, blah, 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 blah. What is this? God is recounting a list of worldly rulers at the time of John the Baptist. Last week, Junior D'Souza spoke about the promise God had given to John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were barren. They'd been faithful, but they had not been fruitful. And the Lord sent an angel, Gabriel, to promise their fruitfulness. Now, it's 30 years after that promise has been fulfilled. John the Baptist has been waiting in the wilderness. He's been growing in the Lord, and he's predominantly been silent all of his ministry life. But guess what? John in the wilderness is awaiting the word of the Lord. And did you know one of God's sentences can eclipse all of the halls of power? And the word of the Lord came unto John. I want you to see something. We are living in a time where, first of all, God, look at your notes, is moving global chess pieces on the world scene. Have you figured out that something's up globally? We're in an age where you can flip on the television, you can look at your phone, and you immediately see global news, but it's like a bunch of pins without a pin cushion. We don't know how to interpret those individual instances right now, but I want to encourage you today that God is still the Lord of heaven and earth and all the nations of the world, and nothing occurs without his sovereign hand guiding it. Jeremiah chapter 1 says, not one nation comes to power, but that the Lord empowers and gives permission. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus Christ holds the key of David and he opens every door that cannot be closed and every door he closes no one can open and he holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Don't be afraid of the devil and the dark. Satan does not control the hour of your death. Jesus Christ does. The keys are in safe hands today. I want you to know something. It's not all about you. Did you know God's moving global chess pieces together? What did this all mean? The 15th year of Tiberius, who was that? He was the emperor of Rome at the time of Jesus. He was the stepson of Augustus. Wasn't that long ago I was standing in Rome at the tomb of Augustus, and I was walking where these people walked. And did you know that God will not move and bring his word and release the perfect will he has for your life until everything and everyone outside your life is set up. Now, Tiberius was the emperor. It was his 15th year. Then Pontius Pilate, I remember a little child recently that said their favorite biblical character was Pontius the pilot, and it gave them great inspiration to pursue their flying career. (laughs) 
So, you know, one of these names mean Tiberi. Who's Tiberius? Tiberius was the emperor, Pontius Pilate, from 26 to 36 AD, was a procurator, sort of like a governor in our terms. And then Herod Antipas is mentioned, and Herod Philip, and a guy, a weird guy named Licinius, one of his relatives, and then Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest. I want you to look at something. Look at the political scene at about the time Jesus comes into his earthly ministry. Take a look at your notes. What God calls the perfect time, men call a godless time. Did you know just about the moment the word of the Lord comes to John, which is going to release him into the world for about one year of ministry, then the Messiah himself, the desire of all the ages, is going to come. But did you know the time God said was a perfect time men called a godless time? Does this look pretty good with Tiberius as the emperor of Rome? I don't want to go into his excesses. I don't want to tell you about Pontius Pilate. I could tell you a lot about Herod Antipas and Herod Philip. Herod Philip was a nice guy. He was a good man. But most of these guys were dogs. The political scene was a scene of chaos in the natural. It looked like an evil time, but God said it's a perfect time for the word of the Lord to come to you. Did you know we're going to see in a minute the word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness? Did you know the word of the Lord always comes to us in the big wildernesses and the small wildernesses of our lives? And one sentence of God can eclipse all of these people of power. Who are these folks? Well, in Luke 3, 1 and 2, they were the power brokers of the ancient world. And they represented the who's who's list of anyone you'd want to have association with. And the political scene, though, is defined, and it's just not a good. It's a clash of cultures. It's a shaking of established ideas. The religious scene, how was that doing about the time Jesus showed up? Well, the Pharisees and the scribes, who were the big religious leaders, were totally alienated from the people. They wouldn't even talk to common people like you or me. It was a nasty religious situation. You may look at your life and say, Craig, I see corruption in the church. I see people misusing God's name. It's a terrible time, but God says it's a perfect time for him to move. And I want you to be encouraged to know that whatever you see on CNN, okay, they're never going to tell you the good news. They're never going to just show up and say, hi, everything's fine today. God's in control. Bye-bye. All right? They're, they're going to put an electron microscope on every disheveled nation and every... But I want you to be encouraged as believers that the earth is not globally left in the hands of a chance. God's moving the chess pieces of nations together, and he's the same God that brought the 15th year of Tiberius, brought Pontius Pilate, lined him up, brought Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, brought Licinius, brought Annas and Caiaphas. He put the political and religious system exactly where it was because it's not all about you. Now, let me ask you, is that about you? No. Do you control that uh, Barack Obama is the president of the United States? No, you don't control that right now. That's a little out of your hands. Unless you cast one vote, that was about the end of your control. So it's as though someone says when Barack Obama was president of the United States and, and fill in the blanks, the word of the Lord came unto her. The word of the Lord came unto him. I want to encourage you. God is the God of global control. Jeremiah was right. He likens nations coming to power as a bucket being kicked over. And God says, not one bucket gets kicked over, not one nation comes to power, but that I've moved the chess piece into a sovereign position. But notice, all of these global chess pieces on the world scene had absolutely nothing to do with you. But in a way, it has everything to do with you and your family. Because God knows exactly the right time to bless you. So do you know what people call an evil time? God calls the right time. And secondly, did you know the people that God came to, his people, Israel? Were they in a good spiritual condition when John's ministry arose and Jesus showed up? Nope. Their hearts had grown cold. The priesthood had had become just a, a political tool and pawn of Rome. The Pharisees were alienated from the people. The Sadducees were worldly compromisers that just wanted to get along with Rome. It was a horrible religious scene when Jesus declared it just the right time to manifest his ministry. Jesus says in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled. You know, Jesus shows up and goes, it's the perfect time for me to be here in the midst of this political and religious chaos. Take heart. Tiberius Caesar doesn't rule the world. Neither does Pilate rule your world. 
Neither does a list of any names you could bring up in the contemporary world. And what's our hope point? God is the Lord of history and nations and your world, and he's moving now in ways independent of you. Now, I want to encourage some of you have done a lot of good things in your life. Some of you have been faithful in the midst of impossible situations. But now, it's not about that. It's about everybody else watching how well you walk out the next few years of your life. Did you know sometimes you fall into a deep place, you fall into a gully, you fall into some kind of pit, and you're, you may even be responsible for rolling yourself down into the pit, but do you know when you, you, when you start walking out of that pit, after a while it's not about you anymore. God's forgiven you, he's cleansed you, he's empowered you, but it is about everybody else watching you come through. Did you know there's a lot of people watching you right now? Mm -hmm. Friends and enemies. Enemies are grinding their teeth, hoping you will not make it out alive so they can rejoice. Your friends are sort of sure you're going to make it out alive, but if it's left up to you, they're almost convinced you will never make it. You'll die there. But everybody, <laughs> friends, enemies, God, angels. You know, God had to say to Joshua, the man who followed after Moses four times, be of good courage, Joshua, four times. Moses is a hard act to follow. Wouldn't you agree? How'd you like to follow him? They say never follow an animal act, a child act, or a one-armed pianist. Mm-hmm. Did you amen that, Marie? Okay. I think I just woke her up. She just went, hey, man. Yeah, wrong time, honey. Let me get to the punchline. Never follow... <laughs> hey! <laughs> Never follow a child act, an animal act, a one-armed pianist. Let me just tell you, let me put a little bookmark at the point. When I was 13 years old, I was at the Iowa State Fair. I'd sung, I'd won every bit of the competition up to that point, okay? I came up to do my last song, and I was going to kick a little butt and win, and there was a one-armed organist with cancer playing a gospel song. If I'm lying, I'm dying. A one-armed organist with cancer playing, bringing in the sheaves. I thought, oh, that's it. Anyway, so there, <laughs> what does that mean, Marie? What does that mean to you personally? Well, what it means, I have a point. <laughs> there's, cer <laughs> there's certain acts that are hard to follow. God's doing an awful lot of new things in our lives. It's really hard right now to just realize that it might not be about you. It might be now about you finishing well. It might be about you just keeping a good attitude in the midst of difficulty. Did you know one per best compliment I ever got in my life was somebody told me once, Pastor Craig, I did not kill myself because, not because of any of your wonderful snappy sermons and, and they're snappy. This person said, those are wonderful and the messages kept me alive. But she said, what kept me alive is I watched how you walked through some difficulties in life and I saw you get better and not bitter. And I saw you come out and I thought, if he can do it and he puts up with it and he walks through, I'm not going to kill myself. I can make it. Did you know there's a lot of people watching you? And it matters. If you don't think they are, just screw up. They'll, you, they all become theologians. You mess up at work, everybody comes out of the woodwork and say, Christians aren't supposed to do that. They become PhDs in the moment of Christianity, morals, ethics, and everything as soon as you mess up. So they're watching. But loved one, listen, keep walking. It's not about you anymore. It's about all of those watching you. It's about God globally setting events in order so that his work. Did you notice when the word of the Lord came to John, the historical situation was perfect. God knows how to bring a man and a culture together. He prepares the world for the gospel, the gospel for the world. And guess what? Some of you that have been faithful in the wilderness are just about to receive your word. And notice John did not run until he was summoned. John stayed in the wilderness until the world wilderness had ripened him. Junior talked to us last week about seasons of silence where you have no voice and no choice. Remember Zechariah and Elizabeth, Ma, uh, uh, John the Baptist, mom and dad? Zechariah disbelieved the word of the angel and was smitten dumb. He had no voice and no choice for a season of time. You know, divine silence can come upon your life for a season. You may be in the wilderness, but take heart. While you're in the wilderness being faithful, God is putting Tiberius in place, Pilate in place, the two Herods in place, Licinius in place, Annas, Caiaphas. The political and religious situation is being chiropractically adjusted and 
been put in place because God always speaks his word in history, in time, where it can be measured. And that's what God's doing globally right now. Don't be depressed. You know, sometimes you can edit things to make it look like God is not in control at all. Did you get that picture? Do you remember movies used to be the guys in the white hats were the good guys, the guys in the black hats were the bad guys? Remember? And the good guy always got the girl at the end and everybody lived happily ever after. Well, now that's being manipulated so that that doesn't happen. Black and white are blurred. You know, you got to go by a grayscale. Nothing's right or wrong anymore. It's a matter of your perception. And, and you read, I won't mention the movies, but I saw one movie where, my Lord, everybody died in the movie. And I just wanted to go jump off a cliff, you know. <laughs> After paying $10 to escape and transcend, I didn't want everybody in the movie to go kill themselves. <laughs> That's another tape. All right. Secondly, I want you to notice something that isn't all about you. God's preparation is hidden in man's unpreparedness. Listen to this principle. God's preparation is hidden in man's unpreparedness. What do I mean by this? Well, did you know the sign of Jesus being the Messiah? Let me read it to you. Luke 2, 11 and 12. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. Did you know the Messiah was going to be recognized and identified? The very emblem of his identity was two things, swaddling clothes and a manger. What do we mean by that? Swaddling clothes represent passionate preparedness. Mothers who were expecting always took the time to personally make and design all the swaddling clothes for the baby. Do you know what swaddling clothes were? We're not talking about a little bit of a diaper. We're talking about a little mummy. You wrap the baby's leg, and then you wrap all the legs, and then you wrap the, the, the body, and then you wrap the arms. They look like mummies. They were wrapped up really hard and contained like little mummies, and they just leave the trap door open in the back for convenience sake. <laughs> now, can you imagine if you need to feel a sense of containment, wrap a kid up like a mummy, and then give him to his mommy, all right? That's what swaddling clothes were. They represent what you can do, what you can do to prepare your heart for the visitation of the Lord. Mary was preparing those swaddling clothes, and many of you have been preparing your gifts, your talents, and your abilities. That's the, that's the idea or principle of preparedness. God does want us to do what we can do. Come on. When it does depend on us, get your swaddling clothes ready. All right? Do all you can do. Be the best you can be. But notice the second symbol after swaddling clothes is the manger. That represents craziness. Nobody expected the Messiah to be born in a manger. Who'd have thunk it? Every human expectation was failed when Jesus showed up. Did you know that about him? By the way, it's still true today. Every time Jesus shows up, he'll always fail one of your expectations. Always challenge your expectations. Because no one expected a Messiah like that. Yeah, they knew about sacrifice and the servant of the Lord and all this, but they didn't have a developed idea. They wanted an Alexander the Great riding a white steed coming into the temple to kick the butt of Rome and give back the authority to God's people. But guess what? That's not what happened. You see, the swaddling clothes of Christ represent the preparedness, what we can do, what's in our power. But the manger represents the fact that God's promises always exceed. His fulfillments are always wilder than his promises. You know, when God promises something to you, here, here's what a promise may sound like. Yea, I shall use you above all your contemporaries. Oh, isn't that lovely? Put that in your Bible. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Put that wherever you want. <laughs> that was a clear word, wasn't it? Clear promise. Yea, I will use you above your contemporaries. Do you know the fulfillment of that? might be something you are not expecting. That's the manger principle. It's going to be crazy. It's going to take a left turn and a right turn. It's going to go up and down like Joseph. You know, he's a good little boy. He goes from the promise to the pit, to Potiphar's house, to prison, finally to prominence. I mean, heavens. Did you know God's fulfillments are always greater and weirder than his promises? What that means is you don't have control. You have control of the swaddling clothes aspect of things. You can prepare your heart, but you have no control over the manger. God's preparedness, it, God's preparation is always seen in our unpreparedness. And you have nothing to do with that. That's, nothing, that's not about me. I wish I could rewrite the Bible. I would take scissors and cut out whole sections of Scripture. And I wouldn't take much out. Just a little bit, just a little here and there. It's a little smattering. It's not like the Thomas Jefferson Bible. I would just cut a few things out. 
So I want to sell the Craig Johnson Bible with an exacto knife. So you can just cut out what you want. But <laughs> you know what? I wish that I could rewrite a lot of things that God says. But you know, he always has a reason for saying what he says and a reason for ordering what he does because he sees the global picture as well as your local picture. See, you only see your relationship right now. You only see all your needs right now. You only see, you can't see the forest for the trees. He's in the helicopter. He's able to see the global significance. No, hold on, hold on, Tiberius. It's his 14th year. It's not his 15th year. It's got to be his 15th year. Pontius Pilate isn't governor. Okay, he's the procurator now. Okay, oh, who's the high priest? See, God is lining a lot of things up that have nothing to do with you. And the time he chooses is always the best time. The people he visits always look a little bit crazy. The people he chooses to use, forget about it. What is he thinking? Did you know in the nativity of Jesus, the first people that come to Jesus are the shepherds? Do you know that their testimony wasn't even trusted in court? The rabbis called them dogs, like they called Gentiles dogs. But Christ first allows the precious shepherds tending the very sheep destined for the temple. He lets them come. And he lets them see that the sign he is the Messiah is the swaddling clothes in the manger. Loved one, prepare all you can, your little swaddling clothes. But at the end of the day, it's the manger principle that's going to prevail. God's going to do it weird. He's not going to do it your way. It's not in your comfort zone. It's going to be completely uh, different than you thought. I just edited myself. I'm so proud right now. The manger principle says, whatever you think, do the opposite, probably. Remember people said, whatever the devil says, do the opposite. Well, guess what? In ministry life, when you obey Christ, he will tell you to do something because that's the manger principle. It, it's, it's his preparation in the midst of your unpreparedness. No, the Messiah shouldn't be born here. How many times have you had to lecture the Lord? Lord, come here. This is going to look inappropriate. It's not even a manger. It's where cows eat. They're slop here. Put the God-man in a diaper in the slop. Yes, manger principle. Do exactly what I say the way I say it. And you just go, wait a minute. The king should be born in a palace. He should have a throne. God says, it's not all about you. It's about me. And I want you, do your swaddling clothes, but the manger is mine. How I'm going to move is completely counterintuitive to every bone in your body. <laughs> and guess what? Was everybody just happy the Messiah was born and came that way? Absolutely not. By the way, did the word of the Lord come to the priests? No. Let me conclude with this. It came to John in the wilderness an insignificant nobody. God lists through Luke a whole bunch of somebodies to juxtapose them with the nobody. But you know what? We all have influence. Did you know we're all famous? Either intensively or extensively. Now, we're not all going to be famous like Pastor Joel and not going to be like Billy Graham. You may not be, have your own TV show like Oprah or something. That's extensive fame. But intensive fame, you're all famous to your children. You're all famous to your husbands and wives. You're all famous to your coworkers. Just mess up and you'll see. You're intensively famous, whether you like it or not. You don't have a choice. Your influence is that something that will always go on. You don't sin unto yourself. You don't do righteous deeds unto yourself. Everyone's affected around you by what you do for good or for evil. Here's the good news. It's not all about you. The global chess pieces right now, whew, you don't have to do anything about that. You just watch it and eat popcorn. You just go, yes, God. However it looks now, he's bringing the 15th year of Tiberius. He's bringing Pontius Pilate. He's bringing the political religious scene to be exactly where it's supposed to be. But then, but then, he's going to bring his preparation in the midst of your unpreparedness. Swaddling clothes in the manger. Do your part, but it's his deal. And you know, I don't, it's not all about me. I don't like that. I don't like swaddling clothes in the manger thing. I like the swaddling clothes part. But see, I'd cut the manger part out because it's too unpredictable. Jesus, come on, come on. Who's going to fall? You're so unpredictable. It's not good for PR. I mean, the manger thing is a little bit crazy, and I really, have you counseled the Lord recently? Because just to calm him down a bit. Lord, you don't seem to understand the ramifications of getting in their boat. If you get in their boat, then it's going to seem... He's Lord, the Lord of nations, and the Lord of your private world. And what he's doing is not all about you. Thank God. And so, finally, did you know what? 
We just need to finish well. Second Timothy tells it the best. Paul the apostle, just before he dies in verse 7, says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finish well. Your whole world is watching you do the next right thing. You know, you just have to do the next right thing in the midst of your life right now. You say, Craig, look, I don't understand what's going on in the world. Nations are falling apart. It's the end times. The world's going to end. May 21st? Whew. Thank God. I got my flight to Houston on the 20th. And I'm running up my credit cards. I got a feeling it's not going to happen just yet. Because you know what? God's not finished with the work in, he's doing in your life. So you know what? You don't need to know anything, you, but you can finish well. You may not be the prettiest woman in the world, but you can finish well. You may not be the handsomest man in the world, but you can finish well. You may not have every talent, gift, and ability and all the chances other people have had, but you can control how well you finish. doesn't even matter how you started. Finish well because everybody's watching you right now. Trust me. Now, I know in the middle of the night the devil tells you you're worthless and meaningless and you're totally isolated and it's all my and no one's caring and no one looks. Guess what? That's the moment when everybody's looking to see what you're going to do. Because they may live or die based on how well you talk about your situation. Like Junior said last week, you know, if a fish keeps his mouth shut, he won't get caught, you know? Sometimes what we say and what we don't say is important. Sometimes silence is the best response to a question. So we're in control of finishing well with our words, finish well with our lives, let our children see us, let everybody see us walk the talk talk is cheap, but when you walk the talk and you finish well at the end, then everyone sitting in the stands will cheer you on and say, wow, look at that. You know, finishing well, that's all about me. Global chess pieces, that's not all about me. How God chooses to move in his weird manger ways is not about me. I just have to say, yes, Lord, I'm on board. But did you know finishing well is all about me? No one can do my praying for me, do my Bible study for me, and no one can finish well for me. But I want to encourage you. With the help of the Lord, you can outwalk everything because everyone's watching now. It's not all about you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you've chosen to make us, let us be witnesses in our time. Thank you that everybody, friend and foe alike, are watching us. And Lord, we can give over the global chess pieces. You're in charge of that. We give over everything we're not in control of. We thank you. You're positioning us for the promise. But like John in the wilderness, we wait patiently to be called. And we're not going to run before we're summoned. And we thank you that everything's just about lined up for your will to be done in and through us. And we give you praise and we have hopeful anticipation that it's going to be well in Jesus' name. And everyone set. Amen.